Horror games, if you couldn't tell, are something I enjoy quite a bit. Whether it be for the atmosphere, gameplay, story, or sometimes even art style, being as enthralled with spooky content such as this, sometimes it makes me want to seek it out in places you'd usually not expect it to be in. It's honestly why I feel this entire medium of mascot horror is so effective in captivating people's interests. You take something that shouldn't be scary on the surface and twist it to be. Whether from corrupting the faces of friendly mascots or digging to uncover the seedy and sinister underbelly of why things went awry. But this line of thinking can obviously extend past that restriction too. And I believe a good place to find content like this is scattered all throughout the Valve catalog. Now, when you think of the Source Engine in horror, your mind usually goes down one of two paths. You either think of the rise in popularity of liminal horror and the fear of isolation that it can invoke through the engine, or if you're in the 15 to 17 age range like I am, you probably think of Vanoss Gaming Gmod horror map videos. Thank God, a button that actually does something good for once. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Despite this, Valve and horror aren't necessarily mutually exclusive from one another. Horror elements are scattered all throughout Half-Life with cosmic threats and spooky set pieces, to the claustrophobic and eerily clinical feel of the two Portal games, to a wave-based shooter literally themed around zombies, like I don't think it gets more obvious. And although a lot of these things couldn't necessarily be classified entirely within the horror genre, Half-Life and Left 4 Dead fundamentally being action games and Portal fundamentally being a puzzle game, there is a popular Valve IP that seemingly doesn't have many horror elements to it at all. And despite that, there's a hefty amount of spooky content regarding it. TF2 and horror are probably not what you immediately associate together when thinking about one another. Out of most of Valve's catalog, this game probably features some of the least amount of frightening imagery, only probably being beaten out by like Counter-Strike or Dota. Though despite this, TF2 still has a very prominent spooky community attached to it, being associated with popular community game modes like Slender Fortress, or more recently, being prominently included in ARGs and digital horror, like Gunslinger Pro 2009 and obviously Emesis Blue, which is a full-fledged TF2 horror movie made entirely in Source Filmmaker. And despite being such a niche concept, it is certainly one of the best things this community has ever created, which I believe proves my point. It's interesting to see these characters involved in darker, spookier themes and settings like the examples previously given. And with Source being as accessible and user-friendly as it is, there has been a handful of community-made horror maps playable directly from the TF2 server browser. Custom TF2 maps and game modes usually tend to have pretty large variations in quality, so I picked out two horror maps that I could find through the community workshop to see if this medium can be used to make something truly spooky. From my research, these seem to be the two most prominent horror maps being made in the game, with one being fairly long and having a good stretch of content, and the other one being named Basement Demo, which I assume is going to be shorter, so we'll start with that one first. Basement Demo is the first out of the two maps you will be covering, and honestly for TF2, makes pretty good use of the atmosphere. The map is pretty short, being able to be beat in less than 10 minutes if you know what you're doing. The whole style and structure to it all reminds me a lot of a mix between Resident Evil and PT, with the obvious purpose of this map serving to be a small demo for something bigger yet to come later down the line. The Resident Evil inspiration shining through with the puzzles that you need to do in the map. You're given access to a few rooms in the basement, with your goal being to unstick this tool lodged in a hydraulic press. Starting the process of getting it out is very roundabout, as you need to grab a key from this drawer of this room, grab a map that you honestly don't really need, and then find another key and another dresser to unlock one more room that finally allows you to do the first puzzle of this map. Alright, look, I get the map is going to be short enough as is, but I honestly just really dislike this approach to progression, where you have to go to every other room in a given area before you you can just get to the place you actually need to be at. But regardless, that's not even really the biggest problem we're about to face. Finally getting into the room, we are met with a very basic puzzle. Three examples of a cow, a snake, and a spider are given to us with the number of limbs they have, implying that we now need to match the same for the other examples given to us. Sounds simple, right? Well, it should be. With this being a TF2 map, interactivity accuracy is not going to be that great since this game wasn't built for that. 
So solving the puzzle itself was easy, but actually having to position yourself to the right spot to press the correct option was an absolute nightmare. It also doesn't help that for some reason, your crosshair is also disabled in this map, so that's just wonderful. But through brute force, or maybe just luck, if you're able to persist to actually finish the puzzle, a hatch in the wall opens up to give you the fuse box switch that you need to add onto the broken fuse box we saw earlier. Also, when you solve the puzzle, the sound that plays to indicate that you did is the Batman Arkham Asylum intercom jingle for some reason. Which honestly kind of caught me off guard, since that sound was super scary to me as a kid for some reason. Say, when did that game come out again? 2009? Jesus, man. It still holds up really well. Like, the combat in that game is still so fluid. Oh, what, what were we talking about? No, oh, right, TF2, yeah, we'll get back to that. Anyways, getting the generator piece finally allows us to do the puzzle with the chess piece plugs. Wonder where they got this idea from. Obviously, it's fine to take inspiration from the chess puzzle from Resident Evil 2. I mean, My Friendly Neighborhood, a game we also covered on this channel, did the exact same thing. So I assume it's just a good format for puzzles like this. The poem it gives you to base what you're supposed to do is simple enough, and once again, your biggest hurdle is just going to be trying to align your crosshair to actually hit the correct thing. But once you get it, the presses in the other room activate, giving you the screwdriver you can use to break out of here. But of course, it wasn't going to be that easy. This guy spawns in here, and if you touch him, he'll kill you. But if he kills you, you need to restart the whole map over, and it'll send you the gravel pit. For some reason, I thought it'd be a good idea to just walk right into him the first time I played this map, so I had to do this whole thing all over again. Unsurprisingly, it didn't actually have any AI, and just moves on a set path, and just simply triggers a kill barrier if you get too close. What you actually have to do when you get to this part of the game is just go to this little vent over here on the wall, and individually pry every single duct to escape the basement. While you're doing this, you'll have to move up and down a couple of times so you don't get caught by the monster, and while you do this, you get a pretty good look at the thing, and honestly, yeah, this model is just not that great, sorry. It kinda looks like SCP-939 with being a big, skinned dog, but this model is also like gummier? I don't know how to describe it, it just doesn't have teeth or anything. Avoiding this guy, we eventually make our way through the vent and into the blocked off room from earlier. Walking out takes us to a foggy street, and if you walk down far enough, you get the title card for Grafton Mansion, a Crypto Forest sequel. What? Okay, so we might have played these games out of order. Because if you're unaware, Crypto Forest is the name of something else, and no, it does not have to do with cryptocurrency. Crypto Forest is another TF2 horror map that was actually worked on by the same people as Basement Demo, with this one having a fully fledged finished campaign with multiple endings for us to play. And it also looks a lot more polished than this little showcase teasing a sequel that might never come out. I don't know, there hasn't been an update in a while. Another good thing about this map is that that it has multiplayer support as well. One from the Mario movie. What? They're, they're back at it again. I just saw it run by and it played the little ding. <laughs> so I got some buddies to tag along with me as we tackled this absolute behemoth of an adventure map. So without further ado, let's get into Crypto Forest. Now, TF2 adventure maps in general aren't a very common find, let alone one to this scale. Crypto Forest is very unique in its structure, having a very vast and open campsite to explore with various landmarks and objectives to complete. Spawning in, you don't really have a clear objective until a voice speaks out to you. Being told to meet at the lake, a waypoint spawns and we make our way towards there to meet the shopkeeper, who will be our main quest giver for the remainder of the game. Now, the quests you are given throughout your playthrough of this game are fairly simple, a lot of them just amounting to you having to go around the map to retrieve an item or multiple items. Some quests make them more obvious than others, but a very interesting caveat to the structure of this map is the night system, where every night, a new event takes place for you to take part of. The fact that this game is structured in nights is very interesting as well, considering there's no day or night cycle, so the sky is just always night. Though the night cycle certainly does share a genuine purpose. Every night or night 
night two at bare minimum, a boss event will happen that'll force the shopkeeper to close up. These bosses are cool in concept, but honestly aren't really that interesting. They're all just borderline shadow PNGs with very basic attacks and work more as distractions to eliminate to continue the map. The first one you fight is the Flatwoods Monster, which is described as being alien in nature. When touching down, it shoots really powerful rockets at you, and blast damage is the only way you can significantly damage this thing. You're probably gonna have to respawn a couple of times though. After doing some more quests for the shopkeeper, you'll be able to progress enough to generate power back to the light by the hunter shack. Doing this triggers the Mothman spawning, who is the second boss. He functions very similar to the Flatwoods monster, but he also has the ability to temporarily blind you and your teammates, which can be very annoying. Though, after defeating this guy, we get to how far I had gotten into this game on my first playthrough. The knight system just doesn't work as a way to trigger certain events. It also works as a countdown. If you don't complete the necessary objectives by the beginning of night 4, you'll be locked into the bad ending. A giant tentacle monster with a gaping mouth called the Leviathan will spawn in the middle of the sky and completely wipe out your party in the process. If this happens, what I can only believe is a nuke is dropped on the forest and there's no respawning back, meaning you need to restart the map from the absolute beginning. You're also taking the gravel pit again if you fail, which I don't know what these maps in gravel pit are about. Anyways, loading back in, we do everything we already did, but hopefully a little quicker. Get the lockbox, mushrooms, fight the flatwoods monster, dig up goatman, fight mothman, etc. And if you're quick enough, you get the keys to the abandoned power plant on the edge of the map. Going in here reveals that by the lake cabins, there's a secret wall that you can break into, and if you do so, you get keys that you can use to open the other door at the bottom of the power plant. Inside this room is a radio station you can use to contact a ranger to come rescue you via helicopter. But this is a horror map, and if you know anything about helicopters in horror games, it's not going to be that easy. Although, this helicopter crash does get the attention of the military, who kindly drops us several cannons around the map, which is convenient because the Leviathan is back. But now having the means to defend ourselves from it, we fire all the cannons scattered around the map and rid its evil from the world for good. Being thanked by the shopkeeper, he finally gives us some car keys to use to get out of this forest. And with that, he lets us go, which gives us the good ending of Crypto Forest. This is most likely the canon ending, judging how the basement demo is supposed to be a sequel to this, but we still have one more ending to achieve after this. If you're able to complete the beginning quest in a quick enough manner, you're given one more bonus side quest by the shopkeeper to hunt down and shoot 10 blue medallions hung up around the map. You know, with how clearly inspired these map makers are by Resident Evil, I'm starting to think that Basement Demo might have been more inspired by the Resident Evil 7 demo than PT. Anyways, shooting all of these medallions down and reporting back to the trader gives us a secret key that the shopkeeper himself says he doesn't know what is used for. But if we were to go into one of the cabins, we can unlock this latch on the floor, which gives us the car keys early. The shopkeeper questions what we're doing, but it's already too late. As we drive off, escaping without getting rid of the Leviathan. Honestly, a pretty unsatisfactory ending judging what you have to do to get it, but it's still a neat addition nonetheless. Crypto Forest is certainly a really fun TF2 adventure map. There are also so much more hidden details and things to find in the map yourself, such as a series of tapes you can play that chronologue the events of what happened before you arrived, as well as some other neat details that somewhat tie Basement Demo in with this map. This house on the hill apparently meeting to be Grafton Mansion, which I think is pretty neat. I'd recommend giving this one a shot if you like TF2, but want to play something that plays nothing like the base game for a change of pace. This map is really well crafted, and I think most people would just have fun exploring and getting lost in this place. Moving on though, we go to our next TF2 horror map. Uh... Uh, So, we've hit kind of a roadblock here. There doesn't really seem to be many other TF2 horror maps. I scoured the web and the workshop for more, but these two seem to be the only legitimate horror maps made inside of TF2. But that made me question. What about outside of TF2? And that's when I discovered this. 
yeah, we're really scraping the bottom of the barrel here. So this game is called Poot, and the description of the game is, after a 12 hour long stalemate, the blue spy decides to go to Red's intelligence late at night. Alas, there is someone waiting for him. Downloading the Windows version of the game, we boot up and set off to our journey, uh, uh, oh, okay. Okay, so I guess the Windows version of this game just doesn't work. I tried a few attempts, and I got a little bit of a distance in without falling. But after many tries, I believe that this is just truly unplayable on Windows, unfortunately. But I didn't give up there just yet. There is a full playthrough of the game on YouTube for us to look at, even if I can't play the game myself. I know this is kind of cheating, and I'm not really getting to experience the game, but like... Dude, it's poot, and you're already this far into the video, do you really care? Anyways, wasting no more time, stepping into the game, we can see that all the assets were beautifully crafted from the ground up for this experience. And our goal is to sap all these door locks to get to the intelligence room. But, after our first sap, we make contact with him for the first time. After this interaction, Poot spawns on the map and he'll make his way towards you on a set path for the rest of the game while you have to open more of the locks. I actually find it interesting how this model actually seems to be 3D despite every other asset being flat, which I honestly thought was kind of funny, especially when he's just doing his signature heavy slide. Avoiding it and getting all the locks tapped that are scattered around the maze, you eventually get into the intelligence room and take the enemy intelligence. Now, with Poot hot on our tail, we can escape the facility, and when we do, this splice dialogue is played. You cannot hide, coward! What was that? Brilliant. I know this one was kind of cheating since this is not actually made in TF2 and is probably just some kid's school project or something, but, you know, it's TF2 related and it's horror so it counts. Kinda. TF2 and horror will probably continue to have a pretty interesting relationship moving forward. I am unsure if the Crypto Forest mythos will be followed up on anytime soon, as the basement demo is almost two years old at this point, but I'm honestly also optimistic for the potential of new adventure maps in the same vein to release in the coming future as well. I really want to believe Emesis Blue will have a big inspiration on TF2 fans to keep creating content like this, and with a direct sequel to that movie also in production, right now. I am very intrigued for what this super strange niche of this community could potentially expand on in the very near future. And even if there's anything I might have missed, I'm certainly still excited to inevitably discover what it may be in due time. Anyways, that was my dive into TF2's spooky playable content. Other than that, I've been Dags, and until next time, see ya.